We are discussing how to generate hope in a desperate situation. And I understand that perhaps Providence has brought you by today to find this. There was a first session that I spoke to you about cultural hope and how our achievements and our successes and what we've been able to do in this world, maybe even a college degree or, or perhaps a, an achievement that you think that you'll never, that'll never go away. And what happens is in cultural hope, our source becomes the God of this world. You don't want to generate that kind of hope. But unfortunately, in the Christian world today among ministers, and this is primarily whom I, I talk to as leaders and ministers, unfortunately, cultural hope is just about the only hope that people have. So when the, the horrible sun of a troublesome situation comes upon them, the tests come, the trying times come, they reject that as not from God and began to curse Satan for bringing something unpleasant into their life. Without the trials and without the test, you cannot bring to power and fruition the will of God in your life. It is not just a panacea of victory that you begin to generate hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. But faith is also the fuel that brings hope into your life. We're not looking for a cultural hope. We're looking for a Christian hope, one that is based upon God and his word, which is unchangeable. This is not an optimistic world uh, uh, that something's going to happen. I'm going to, I can't tell you how many ministers I've heard tell me if I win the lottery, if I win the lottery, you know, it, it's a joke, okay? But it's really not a joke. We think that God is just going to dump a load of cash on our houses and that we're going to all of a sudden be able to handle it. If you were given that kind of opportunity, it is possible that the enemy would take it away from you because it would be based on cultural hope. But Christian hope bases it upon God and upon his word that is unchangeable. This optimistic assurance is guaranteed. Simply put, God is my source, and in him I have hope. A long time ago, I found out that the only one who could adequately sign my paycheck was Father God. Long ago, I realized that it was not only dollar bills, but it was help, that it was a sane mind, that God could save me in desperate situations. And I found this scripture that I began to lean on. A young man named Titus who had quite the trials of life trying to come up in a world where there were superstars like Paul and the Apostle Peter. He, he, he was a young man trying to come up and now he writes something that only he can find out through a Christian hope. It's a portion of the scripture that says, In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Where did he learn this? He learned it at the feet of the Apostle Paul, where Paul said, If in this life only we had hope, we would be among men most miserable. You have one foot in this world. You have one foot in the next world. You don't serve this master of this world. You serve the master, the God of hope, who gives us a hope of eternal life. And all that we say and do in this world can be very desperate at times. But his hope that there is a better life, a better world, and that when this life is over, we will wear a crown, a bright and shining crown, and we will rule and reign with him forever. Now, I'm living in a world, and you know I'm, I'm an old guy now, and I, I can say some things, but I'm going to say this very strong. Much of the desperation that I see in ministers today is based on cultural hope, not Christian hope. And many of them don't even talk about the eternal life. Much is not said about going to be with Jesus someday. I was uh, looking through some books uh, a, few, a few weeks ago, a books that a friend of mine, an attorney from Dallas, brought me. His father was a, was a great missionary uh, in Mexico. 
And uh, he's gone on to be with the Lord. He brought me these books and gave them to me. And I found some of his notes in there. I began to read his notes. And all of a sudden, it became very real to me. Uh, it, was a, it was a book of funeral sermons. But, uh, and and I, it all became very real to me that the thing we have in common, whether you're doing a ministry of charity work or, 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 or you're busy right now as a missionary or you are a pastor or an evangelist, I can just say we have one thing in common. One day we will go and live with Jesus Christ eternally. Then I begin to think that his father was with my father and my grandfather right now. I don't, I don't want to get into a, a discussion with you about the hereafter, but I would like to say that was warming to my heart. And I picked up my, my phone and I, I, I text, text the guy and I told him, I said, do you know that our fathers are rejoicing? Their, their battles are over and we still have ours and we're going forward into another life. And we know that a God who cannot lie promised us before our time began. So the very first crank on the engine that generates hope is to say, if in this life only I have hope, I'm miserable, but I don't have hope in this life. I have hope in an eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised me before time began, and no matter what I go through on this earth, if I will stay repentant and clean before him, I will know the kingdom at hand when it's time to go, and I will enjoy for the eternity the power of being with him. And it brings me to what Peter said in 1 Peter 1 and 3. In God's great mercy, actually the scripture says in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So let's tie this together for a moment. Because we're, we're like that race car and, and putting that engine in it and getting the tires just right. But getting the fuel mixture right. What drives you? What propels you into the future out of that desperate situation? Number one, go back and begin to check all systems go. Do you know that this is not the only place that you're going to suffer? You're going to suffer again and again, but one day... If you're faithful, you will go to a place where there will be no more suffering. It was promised you again. And then that will be the reason why in God's great mercy, he gave us new birth into a living hope. So I want you to look at yourself right now. Whatever situation you're in, speak to the mountain and claim that it is moved. Proclaim it to go. Say this mountain has got to leave. Whatever the situation is, do you know if you don't dismiss that situation, it will create more desperate moves, more desperate problems, more desperate things will come out of it, your reactions to it? Oh, my Lord, if I could tell you all the time, I've turned a little molehill into a big mountain. I've turned little situations into great things by escalating them out of fear that I wasn't going to be successful. I wasn't going to come through. But when I began to get the fuel mixture right, that birth, that new birth that was inside of me cranked over and I was able to get maximum power and maximum propulsion to move out of that desperate situation. New can't begin until you begin to see the power generated inside. Right inside of you, right now, I know you preach every week, and every week you're asking someone, repeat after me, or give your heart to the Lord, or come to this altar. But how long has it been since you went to the altar and just said, thank you, Lord, thank you that you promised me eternal life before time began, and in your great mercy, you gave us new birth. I take my new birth. It is a living hope. And how do I know that I have living hope? I have it because Jesus Christ came from the dead. He lives in my heart, and I am going to come out of this desperate situation. Now, we continue on because there are four, not one, two, three, but four faith actions that you can produce to up the power, to generate the propulsion, and to move you into a new place out of that desperate situation with hope. God bless you. I'll see you next time.